This is a video abstract for our paper being published this week in the British Medical Journal. Our paper is about compliance with the new requirements to report the results of all clinical trials conducted in Europe directly onto the European Union's Clinical Trials Register. Just for background, in case you don't know, clinical trials are, of course, one of the most important tools we have in medicine. They're the most fair test of which treatment works best. And we use the results of clinical trials to make informed choices with our patients. But there's a problem. It's been known for many years that the results of clinical trials are routinely left unreported. And this undermines our efforts at evidence-based medicine. Now, very latterly, there have been various rules passed in various different legislations requiring people to report the results of their clinical trials. For example, there's the FDA Amendments Act 2007, which requires a certain category, a subset of trials, with lots and lots of loopholes, to report their trials onto clinicaltrials.gov. And now there is the European Union guideline from 2012, which finally came into force just very recently. And this law requires that all trials report their results directly onto the European Union Clinical Trials Register. Now you'll notice that both the European legislation and the American legislation require results to be reported onto the register rather than in the grey literature, in a conference presentation, or in an academic journal article. That's actually for a very good reason. Reporting directly onto a register means that you have to fill in a whole series of pre-specified boxes specifying exactly what you're going to report. It means that therefore these results are more likely to be complete and accurate. There is in fact, as we discussed in our paper, an enormous literature showing that reports in academic journals, for example, can be incomplete or misrepresent the findings of clinical trials. Reporting results directly onto a register also means that it can happen very quickly. It's not subject to delay from peer review. It's also not subject to delay from editorial review or waiting for publication deadlines. Most importantly, I think it's very straightforward and quick to identify the results, to find them, and it's also therefore very quick to ascertain automatically whether the results have been reported. So, for our paper, we scraped the entire contents of the clinical trials register, that is 30,000 trials. Then we set about looking at the contents of that data set to identify the subset of trials which were due to report results. You can see here from this strobe checklist compliant flowchart uh, that there are around 11,500 trials which are listed as completed or terminated. But several of these were missing completion dates. That's actually quite important because it shows that the European Union Clinical Trials Register is actually missing a lot of information. There's also quite a lot of inconsistent data on there. However, by taking a very conservative approach, we were able to identify 7,274 trials where results were undoubtedly due. So we report the characteristics of trials on the register. We report the characteristics of trials that did and didn't report. And we did a, a logistic regression analysis in order to identify which subsets of trials were more or less likely to report. Now, there are several key findings here. First of all, very concerningly, only around half of all clinical trials that were supposed to report results onto the register had actually done so. Very interestingly, however, there are clear patterns within that data. So first of all, you can see that trials with um, a pharmaceutical industry sponsor are much more likely to report results. And you can see that in the raw data and also in the logistic regression tables where we correct for other factors. You can also see that trials from large sponsors, trials conducted by organizations which have got a lot of experience of conducting trials, are also much more likely to report the results. Now, we weren't satisfied to simply publish a paper in a journal in which we described the prevalence of reporting of clinical trials. We wanted to go further in two different ways. First of all, we wanted to describe the results um, with a, a clear ranking to give audit and feedback data on the individual sponsors. Now, to be absolutely clear, this isn't a naming and shaming operation. Audit and feedback is a well-established tool in medicine. It's something that we use as a matter of routine to improve standards. We identify uh, a gold standard to which we all aspire, and then we set about 
Um, codifying that, finding a way that we can measure the performance against that benchmark. Then we collect data, we share it, we review it, and then people can go out and identify where they need to, to engage in targeted action to try and improve performance. So here we report in our paper, first of all, the, um, the large sponsors with the highest proportion of trials reported, the people who are doing the best. And as you can already imagine from the results that, that we've discussed already, you can see that sponsors from who are pharmaceutical companies have got very high compliance. That's actually, by the way, an incredibly um, positive and reassuring thing to identify. For many, many years, we were told, for example, in responses to the All Trials campaign, that it was unrealistic to ask that people report the results of all clinical trials, including going back in time, for example, to 2004, as the European Union legislation does. What's very interesting here is that you can see, as soon as there was a law passed, as soon as there was a clear rule, drug companies simply acted and got their house in order, got the results up where they need to be. Very disappointingly, on the other hand, you can see that the results from large universities are overwhelmingly very, very poor. Very poor indeed. Now, we also didn't want to give a one hit of this ranking because the idea of audit, the way that you can use audit as a quality improvement tool, is that you have constantly updating data so that people are chasing better performance and also so that people are incentivized or motivated to perform better. So when there have been previous papers or news stories published which give performance rankings like this that were static, in my view the, uh, the incentives for an organisation that has been criticised in a paper like that are actually quite unhelpful because one of the clear opportunities if you're being criticised is to just think, well, we've got to survive the next five days until people get bored of this story and then we'll be okay. If you know that the data is going to be updated on a regular basis, then you also know that if you want to manage your poor performance, if you want to manage any adverse publicity or people having negative views of your organisation on account of your poor performance, if you know that the data is going to be update, updated, then you're motivated, I would hope, to improve your performance as a means of managing the, the PR threat of negative performance uh, metrics. So. That's what we did. This is the raw EU clinical trials register. This is the website that we built with live data. So this is at eu.trialstracker.net. And on this page, you can see overall summary statistics at the top, and then all major sponsors. So that's all sponsors with more than 50 trials ever conducted on the European Union clinical trials register since 2004. You can see for every individual sponsor how many trials they've got in total on the UCTR. You can see how many trials have uh, due to report results and what percentage have reported. We also give data on how many of their trials have got inconsistent data um, and it's the responsibility of the sponsor to make sure that all of their data on the register is uh, complete and correct. So, once a month, we scrape a full copy of the European Union Clinical Trials Register and every month we update the data on this page. But we don't just have data on summary statistics. Because we wanted to make it as easy as possible for people to improve performance, we also wanted to make it easy for people to see which individual clinical trials needed to be reported. So, for example, here, are the results for UCL, University College London, where I did my clinical medicine 100 million years ago. So up at the top, you can see we've got a nice little infographic, and if you tweet the link, then the infographic goes beautifully onto Twitter. Um, and this infographic shows you that out of 20 due trials, which UCL should have reported onto the clinical trials register, only 65% have reported. But most importantly, when you scroll down, you can see all of those individual trials. And if you click on the individual trial uh, registry number, then you can go forward to the European Union Clinical Trials Register and you can read about that trial. You can see what the intervention was, what the control was, you can see who the principal investigator was, you can see what outcomes were measured, how many participants, what the characteristics were, and so on. We hope that trialists and sponsors will use this resource in order to improve performance. And we hope that 
with good reason, because we've already launched a similar tool in the US and we've already had positive feedback from people who are employed by, by uh, American universities to monitor their clinical trials in, uh, uh, within their institution, to check that they've been correctly registered and to check that the results have been correctly reported in accordance with their legal and ethical obligations. This is a picture of our clinical trials tracker, the FDA Amendments Act trials tracker. The data on this, by the way, updates every day, and every day you can see the new trials that have gone overdue. You may also be interested to know that every week in the BMJ, we publish a, a series called Unreported Clinical Trial of the Week. I think this is a, actually a really useful and important initiative Academic journals publish the results of clinical trials which are submitted to them and which get through their various variably stringent criteria on methodological rigour and interest to their readership. But they never publish, of course, by definition, the results of unreported clinical trials, clinical trials which, whose results have not been disclosed. We wanted to fix that. We wanted to draw attention to these clinical trials and also we wanted to take the issue of non-reporting of clinical trials out of the abstract and to make it much more concrete. So each week we report an individual clinical trial, we describe the, uh, the context, we explain the clinical context, how many people are affected by the disease um, that's being studied in the clinical trial, how many people take the treatment, uh, what the current outstanding uncertainties are around that treatment, and then we discuss any interesting clinical or legislative issues that arise from that. Two final, very small bits of context. Firstly, I hope you all know about the All Trials campaign. This is a campaign that we set up around five years ago, and it's a very simple and straightforward ask. We are campaigning to say that all trials must be registered with their results reported and with clinical study reports where those have been created, shared in public. We launched five years ago. Initially, it was a challenge, but since then, I'm very, very pleased to say that we've um, accumulated phenomenal support from hundreds of organisations now, including the great and the good, British funders, NHI, MRC, Welcome, uh, organisations across Europe, professional bodies, um, patient groups, and so on. When we first started campaigning on this issue many, many years ago, it felt like there was no end in sight. And I have to say now I'm feeling much more optimistic. And in particular, with the launch of the European Trials Tracker, it's been very interesting to see positive uh, responses from the European Medicines Agency, from the British House of Commons Science and Technology Select Committee Chair, who is writing a specific report about this issue, and also from the UK Health Research Authority. One final context issue. Everything that we built here, we built in uh, my team here in Oxford. I run something called the Data Lab, and we are a very mixed multidisciplinary team of clinicians, academics, and software engineers. And we're a little bit different to some other academic teams because we take medical and scientific data and we turn that into tools that you can hold in your hand to improve performance. Tools for cold face clinicians, tools for researchers, patients, and the public as well as just pure academic papers. I think that's a really powerful model and it's one I'd like to see more of. So, thank you very much for your time.